Very crucial question. Are we all going to be replaced with shell scripts very soon? Yeah. Only if we're lucky. Um, yeah, so let me give a talk here. We're going to go through about 38 slides in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to need you to, to kind of come with me. To start that off, I just want a quick show of hands. Who is able to raise their hand right now? All right, we're almost all here. Great. Um, the first slide here is really just, I think the way I put it is uh, hipsters and experts are very, very similar. If someone tells you they're either one, they're probably not. Um, so we're going to jump into here. Are we going to be replaced by scripts? Um, the shortest answer possible, no. Slightly longer answer, yes. Um, <laughs> A more accurate answer is probably maybe. So I think we need to step back here and maybe assess what we're even asking. So I mean, one of my first questions is, why do you even know what I'm talking about when I say, are we going to be replaced by scripts, right? This is obviously something that's present in mind. We're thinking about this. Why? What does this mean? Um, and what does the future maybe look like from there, right? So we're going to go through a little bit of a rundown. Um, why? Why are we talking about this? Uh, according to Wikipedia, a script is a program that automates the execution of tasks that could be alternatively be executed one by one by a human operator. So obviously, we're handing over work two programs, seems pretty straightforward. But why are we talking about that, right? I think this is all part of you know, this bigger umbrella that we're kind of calling SDN. Um, but of course, SDN's a problem because if you ask 10 people, um, you're gonna get 12 different answers of what, what SDN actually means or what it means to them or how they're gonna execute on it. Um, there's this whole idea of open flow, which is kind of the origins of the idea into like, the overlay models that most of the vendors are currently taking on now. This idea of intent-based networking is coming in. Really what we're doing is laying, layering abstraction on abstraction on abstraction. Um, and potentially it's just a, a bunch of scripts, right? Um, I think really what we're talking about here is a trend towards automation. What we really want to do is put stuff into the network, uh, configure devices, get them to do the things we want to do, and get information out of the network, pull telemetry and analytics and things off the boxes. Um, in all of this, we have to remember that humans are prone to mistakes. We're not really good at repetitive tasks. We're kind of terrible at it, actually. Um, and everything seems to be changing a little bit quicker, um, so really agility and keeping up. And, and like, I think a big part of everything behind this automation phase is, is really speed, right? How do we make these things go faster? Um, at least it's worked in kind of the computer area with virtualization. So th then we get into this problem of, okay, well, if scripts are going to be doing the work that I was doing, that means, you know, I'm screwed, right? Um, and then there's other folks who are really, really, really happy with, you know, whatever career certification path they've taken, and they really know a CLI really well, and they're just not going to let that go. Um, and I think those are some of the kind of the, the, the resistant points we see to automation today. Um, you know, I'm not a programmer, and, and I don't want to. Another thing that I think is an aspect here that's just kind of a side note, really, is like this idea of simplicity versus complexity. When we're talking about building automation and, and putting you know, controllers on top of things and putting GUIs in front of things, you could potentially make it look simpler, right? Um, but closing your eyes doesn't make the world go away. And abstraction doesn't mean that there's less complexity. It just means that you don't have to deal with it every day. Um, so again, if we're thinking about, you know, will a script replace my job, well, what are you working on? Are you the administrator that's pushing the buttons, or are you the guy that's going to figure out how this thing works behind the scenes when it breaks? I don't know. Um, so again, so who is really quick rundown, right, of who are the engineers we're talking about. So there's internal IT, which in, you know, most corporate worlds is, is the generalists. Um, these are the guys who have to make sure the Wi-Fi is working and the CEO is taking a shit. Um, there's also the data centers. Um, so here you're going to need more striations. There's a little bit more dedicated networking staff. You're going to need more specialized functions. Uh, and the service providers, where obviously, like, the network is the business. And so you've really got a really high hierarchy of, of network engineers. Um, consultants obviously come in and, and help uh, all the others. And, and if there's somebody else who's doing network engineering like outside of that, I'd kind of be interested to hear what your job is. That'd be cool. Um, and I think if we start to look at then, okay, what does the future look like? Or if you take those, those groups of people and, and see what, what's going to happen to us as scripting and automation and, and hopefully like actually systemic use of, of networks becomes more popular, I think we really need to kind of shift it. And instead of going um, vertical in the different you know, categories of where you work, it's more of the function you work in, right? So maybe horizontal. So architecture versus engineering versus operations versus provisioning versus the help desk. Um, so first, architecture, right? Do we still have to design networks? Um, I think, at least for the foreseeable future, humans are the ones who innovate, not, not the machines. Um, it's, it's fairly hard to get a computer to do something that you haven't told it to do, at least in some way. Um, obviously, machine learning may be starting to change some of that, but I, I still think we're a long, long way off before, you know, we're really like having original thought come out of a computer. Um, really building efficiencies, right? Being able to figure out how to put the system together so that all these different pieces of automation are working together. I still think that's a very, very human function. Um, and of course, understanding the system, right? So, so the actual architecture, the design, I think most of us can agree that being able to figure out how to build products, how to build services, how to actually make money from technology is probably a fairly human function. Um, and I think you're going to have new tools, new constraints, um, but I don't see those jobs necessarily, you know, if that's your job, you're probably not going to be replaced by a script, at least not super soon. Um, so engineering, right? Do we still have to go build the networks? Uh, I think even if you have a system that's taking intent and creating a network from it and configuring all your boxes and doing zero-touch provisioning and zero-touch deployments and, and all that stuff, maybe you've even got drones like dropping stuff into the racks in the data center, I think you still have to calibrate that machine at some point, right? You have to tell it 
what that intent is in the beginning. Like, what is the thing you're trying to build? Someone has to kind of take the, the blueprints from the architects and figure out how that actually works. Even if you're working on it through APIs and CLI, instead of CLIs, um, there's still that, right? Capacity planning, looking towards the future, testing the functionality of the design, um, and then maybe instead of you know, implementing this by hacking away uh, on a CLI, you're, you're building software, building templates instead of configs. So I think um, what I would say is less mop, more code is really kind of the future for, for network engineering, for kind of getting the design into an implementation. Right? Um, so then troubleshooting. As we get more and more advanced monitoring, you potentially even move into autonomous remediation where you've got algorithms that can say, okay, well, when this thing happens, you know, maybe the script drops the link out of the lag, runs a you know, ping test across it, drops it off, tells somebody they need to order a new circuit or whatever needs to happen, right? I think those kind of things we'll start to see. Um, complex failures are still gonna be present, and I think, um, like I said, but even though you abstract this away, and maybe the, the typical like, help desk person is gonna be looking at a really cool screen of red and green lights, somebody has to figure out when that thing breaks. Um, but I do think, on the troubleshooting side, I think that's somewhere where we're not gonna be growing a ton of folks uh, in the future, right? Potentially even reducing quite a bit and replacing some of that with automation. Um, provisioning, I think you're, that's probably a job that's not gonna really be existent very much longer. I think that a lot of that gets automated, right? I think there's gonna be somebody managing the system that's doing that, but why not have your portal be able to tie to your billing system and your provisioning system and have templated configurations to go out and turn stuff up? I, you know, I, I don't know if there's a huge amount of creativity and human ingenious going into the provisioning process right now. So probably essentially eliminated. Um, and then the help desk, right? And I think the first thing I think of when I think of the help desk is like, well, somebody else has to answer the phone, right? You need, that, you need a voice on the phone. Um, but every morning I wake up in the morning and I shout out to a disembodied voice in my house, like, Alexa, what's the weather to be today? And I get told an answer. Um, and I don't know that we necessarily have to have humans answering phones always. Um, you know, Alexa, Siri, Cortana, all the way down. Then you've got these APIs and portals. So, you know, the more you can open your services up to customers, the less they need to actually call you about stuff. So I think, you know, that's not necessarily a, a safe spot, right? The help desk potentially has a lot of room for, for automation and, and being bowled over by computers. So I, I think the, the the only thing I can definitively say is if you're not gonna be replaced by a script, um, whatever your definition of script is, uh, they will become your colleagues, right? You are gonna work alongside them. And whether you manage them or are managed by them is probably a little bit up to your decisions over the next few years. Um, so can a script replace me, right? I think a big part of this comes down to people versus processes. If you're just following uh, a, you know, a task of, of 10, 12 steps, if you wanna like add a new VLAN and you've got a 21 step plan to like go through and like make sure there's not a conflict and make sure the naming works and all that stuff, if that's all you're doing, um, just process following, um, you're on the, you know, the, the script replacement side. If you're working with people and actually doing kind of collaborative work, that kind of stuff, again, repetition versus innovation, um, quantitative work versus qualitative work, um, if it can be measured and written down and given to a computer to do, we probably are going to do that. Um, it doesn't mean you do have to be doing that, but, but someone's going to be going to. All right, so now what? Uh, really fast. My biggest concern here is if, if, the help if the help desk goes away and the troubleshooting like operations jobs go away, I'm assuming that is something that happens, then how do people learn networking? At least that's where like most of the people I work with came through that service, right? I mean, there's not a lot of people who, who really go to school to this and get practical knowledge on this. A lot of it comes from that help desk and from those troubleshooting days. And then you're like, okay, now I know how this works because I've figured out how to fix it so many times that I can go build it. And if that's not there, a little concerning. Um, a bigger picture is we're not alone in this, right? I think automation is everywhere. The robot agenda is fully on track. Uh, Goldman Sachs recently fired 600 traders and replaced them with 200 IT staff because they have a bunch of quantitative trading going on. Um, one thing I think that's really relevant here is uh, Kevin Kelly has the seven stages of robot replacement. The first stage is uh, a robot can never do my job, right? It's, it's too special, it's too unique. Uh, the second stage is, well, a robot can do some of my job, but I, you know, I still have to help it for all the other stuff. And the third stage is, okay, the robot can do all of my job, but I have to train it to do new things. And then the fourth stage is, well, the robot can do all the things all the time, but it breaks down a lot, and so I have to still fix it. And then the fifth stage is you find like, okay, that job was never meant for humans in the first place. Job, robot takes the job, I'm gonna go look for something else. The sixth stage is, wow, I really, I really am glad the robot took my last job, because this job is great. And of course, the seventh stage is, I'm super stoked that the robot could never do my job. Um, so, you know, the only constant is change. You work in technology, you need to learn and grow. You, you, you probably don't need to have to, you're probably not, not gonna become a programmer, you're probably not gonna be replaced necessarily by scripts. I think one of the bigger things to remember is that this thing is growing, right? Whether you're talking about IoT or video or this digital revolution that's going on apparently, um, security, the population, the number of devices and the number of networks is increasing. And so if we can slow the rate that like our field has to grow, I don't think that's necessarily cutting any jobs. It's just not maybe backfilling a ton of them, right? There's a different thing there. Um, and the upside is this is the very beginning. There's a lot of resources at Nanog over the years that you can take a look at. Um, also, if you want to get involved in this stuff, 
tons of things to do. That's it. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chris.